this presentation is for gastrointestinal exemplars with a focus on cholecystitis. Cholecystitis is basically just an inflammation of the gallbladder, typically caused by cholelithiasis, which is blockage of the duct by a gallstone. These patients will present with orange urine and clay-colored stool because the stool is not properly exposed to bile during digestion. The orange urine is also found with the bile issues during a gallstone blockage. The elevated bilirubin then gets excreted through the urine. It is of a red-orange color, so the change is seen in the urine, and that orange-brown color of the stool seen normally will be eliminated through the GI tract. With a gallstone blockage, the direct bilirubin will be elevated because the blockage interferes with the excretion into the bile ducts. The indirect bilirubin level is normal because this is the amount measured of bilirubin transported to the liver with albumin. There is no change in this until it turns into conjugated and then cannot be excreted through the bile duct into the intestine. Direct bilirubin is what happens after the bilirubin is changed through the liver, and indirect is the amount of bilirubin prior to metabolism within the liver. Since the injury with cholecystitis occurs after the bilirubin has been changed to direct bilirubin, this level appears to be elevated. When we're thinking about cholecystitis, it's pretty easy to think of your six Fs for who's at risk. It's typically seen with fair-skinned 40-year-old females, so that's a fertile age, with a family history and tend to be fat, so those are your six Fs. Patients can fall outside of these, but this is a generic, typical, biased view of who you're going to see patient-wise. Typically, you can be caused by a duct blockage by a stone. So again, it's just telling us our direct bilirubin at this point is going to be elevated. Indirect is before it actually gets um, conjugated, uh, will be at a normal level. Biliary colic can also be a cause of cholecystitis. And initial complications can include empyemas, gangrene, and or perforation which ultimately can lead to peritonitis because we know inflammation in our peritoneal cavity can be caused by any sort of perforation within our abdominal cavity, cavities. Fistula formation of a fistula within an adjacent organ or gallstone ileus. This is a really quick picture of what you're gonna see, how your patients are gonna present. They can be jaundice, complaints of nausea and vomiting, anorexic, although they tend to be more larger than anorexic, but they may be having feelings of fullness with abdominal distension, so they're unable to eat, fever with leukocytosis. And then typically their pain is right upper quad pain or right shoulder pain radiating to the back, and it typically will increase with deep breaths. You usually will have patients complaining of abrupt onset of pain that's severe and steady in right upper quadrant, radiating to the back shoulder or right scapula. It may only last 12 to 18 hours, but typically it's enough that they will come to the hospital. They will say that it actually gets worse with movement and or breathing, those deep breaths. Patients can be anorexic, nausea, vomiting, have chills and fever, tenderness and guarding within the right upper quadrant on abdominal assessment. As you know, there are multiple treatments that we can do to alleviate these issues in our patients. Uh, so you can have a cholecystectomy. That can be done laparoscopically. So that's just they go in, there's a few um, incisions where they go in and do it laparoscopically. If they have problems and they can't actually fix it, it may become an open cholic. 
So you're going to see the different treatments for what happens to a laparoscopic coli versus a open coli. Whenever we're thinking about open coli, we're thinking about a full surgical procedure. So you want to think about what happens, infection, shock, making sure they have enough fluid resuscitation for those patients. They may need surgery to actually remove gallbladders or gallstones. Um, Medication-wise, you may just need to treat the gallstones, reducing their cholesterol content within the gallstones. The negative issue is that it's costly, it has a long duration, and the patients may still be prone to further stone formation. They may need to be, have opioid analgesics to decrease and treat the pain. Patients may need an NG tube to help relieve nausea and vomiting, NPO. This can be short term or a little bit longer, so determining the time frame for NPO status having them restrict their dietary fat. If they do need, um, if we do need to increase their nutritional status, we would also provide them with fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, along with bile salts. And why would we need to increase their accumulation of bile salts? Because they actually, if one would get jaundice, um, from the bile salts, and we actually would administer medications such as cholesteramine or questran to bind the bile salts, those bile salts actually may start to become decreased significantly. Shockwave lithotripsy may be used to eliminate the stones. And also, patients may need to have an ERCP done to see if the stones can uh, are either gallstone or pancreatic. Now remember, ERCPs, one of the big risk uh, side effects for an ERCP is pancreatitis. So you would be cautious to have that procedure done on your patients. Cholecystitis, patients can be treated outpatient. So if they need a lap coli done, typically, they go to PACU and they can be discharged right from the PACU cone on some oral pain medications. If the surgery um, goes to an open coli, they would maintain inpatient status within a hospital in order to better manage them postoperatively.